Please turn in the back of your Psalter hymnals to Belgic Confession, Article 4, page 855. Now this little string of articles here in the Belgic, we, we, we've already looked at the fact of Article 1 of the only true God and then how he reveals himself in Article 2, revealing himself in creation and in the Bible. And even though creation is not written, the Belgic speaks of it as, as letters that communicate to us knowledge. Even as God also makes himself known to us more specifically and redemptively through his written word, article number three. Article four then gives us what the canonical books are. It says we include in the Holy Scriptures the two volumes of the Old and New Testaments. They are canonical books with which there can be no core at all. And then it lists those books, 39 books in the Old Testament, starting with Genesis, ending in Malachi, and the New Testament, starting with Matthew, uh, ending with Revelation. The Old Covenant, the New Covenant, revelatory documents, Word of God. Then Article 5 gives us the article on the authority of Scripture, the authority of we receive all these books and these only as holy and canonical for the regulating, founding, and establishing of our faith. And we believe without a doubt all things contained in them, not so much because the church receives and approves them as such, but above all because the Holy Spirit testifies in our hearts that they are from God. And also because they prove themselves to be from God, for even the blind themselves are able to see that the things predicted in them do happen. Now that is a statement of the relationship of the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. The Old anticipates the New, and the New records the fulfillment of what the Old anticipates, that is, Christ. And therein establishes not only that God is the sovereign over history, but that also that His Word is true. It's a testimony. And we can see that. It says even the blind. Well, that's, that is the point. <laughs> They're just saying it's, a, it's just so clear. Now, Article 6 uh, spells out the difference between canonical and apocryphal books. Uh, it gives the Old Testament books that uh, have various bits of information in them that may be useful, but they're not canonical. Uh, the people of God to whom the oracles were given never recognized them as such. And then our Article 7, the sufficiency of Scripture. Let us read out loud together this wonderful statement on the sufficiency of Scripture. Let us read together. We believe that this Holy Scripture contains the will of God completely and that everything one must believe to be saved is sufficiently taught in it. For since the entire manner of service which God requires of us is described in it at great length, no one, even an apostle or an angel from heaven, as Paul says, ought to teach other than what the Holy Scriptures have already taught us. For since it is forbidden to add or to subtract from the Word of God, this plainly demonstrates that the teaching is perfect and complete in all respects. Therefore, we must not consider human writings, no matter how holy their offers may have been, equal to the divine writings. Nor may we put custom, nor the majority, nor age, nor the passage of time or persons, nor councils, decrees, or official decisions above the truth of God, for truth is above everything else. For all human beings are liars by nature and more vain than vanity itself. 
Therefore, we reject with all our hearts everything that does not agree with this infallible rule, as we are taught to do by the apostles when they say, Test the spirits to see if they are of God. And also, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house. And so today we will be considering some of these scriptures' qualities, uh, having already seen what scripture is as the Word of God. And because it is the Word of God, and because of what we just read about it, uh, the book of Revelation, which completes the canon, not only the canon of the New Testament, but uh, completes uh, God's written revelation, uh, ends with these uh, very solemn warnings. Revelation 22, 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the prophecy of this from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life in the holy city which are described in this book. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray now that your Holy Spirit would enable us to give proper attention to what your word has to say about itself and its wonderful qualities and characteristics and where that leads us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your outline before you, we're going to be uh, looking this morning at five qualities uh, of Scripture. Five qualities of Scripture. Paul and Peter, one is an apostle to the Jews and the other is an apostle to the Gentiles, agree on the nature of the Bible. Paul says it's inspired by God. It means breathed out by God, the Holy Spirit issuing it. Peter says that the Scriptures are, are uh, the, the words of men, they are the words of men who are carried along by the Holy Spirit so that consequently no scripture uh, is a matter of mere human uh, origin or human source. But those scriptures that we have are of God first and foremost and in the language of man secondly. And it's important to keep that proper priority that both Paul and Peter and the Scripture's own self-identity has. But of course, this identity of Scripture is from the beginning. Questioned, doubted, denied, distorted. This is, this is a, the devil's work. In Genesis chapter 3, what did he come and do right out of the chute? Is he attacked what? The Word of God. Has God said? Has He? <laughs> Has God spoken? Yes or no? And so we read here in the Heidelberg Catech, or not, the Belgic Confession, uh, that uh, the, the Scriptures uh, are something that we receive uh, as authoritative. And we receive them as authoritative, uh, not so much because the church receives and approves them as such, though that is proper testimony, but above all because the Holy Spirit testifies in our hearts that they're from God, and also because they prove themselves to be from God because we can identify and see the things predicted and fulfilled from as we move from Old Covenant to Christ to the New Covenant. We can see their veracity, their truthfulness, and what they are. So that the church proclaims them as such, that is a testimony. I mean, the church itself uh, w w was, uh, as it is, born out of the Word of God, 
from the very beginning, Acts uh, chapter 2, and we proclaim the, those scriptures as such. And they are also uh, self-identifying. Uh, I don't hardly ever reference the Westminster uh, Confession of Faith, but uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith uh, has a, a additional uh, an insightful elaboration upon the doctrine of Scripture uh, on page 920, if you wanted to look at it, uh, in your uh, Psalter hymnals. On number 5, under Scripture, it says, We may be moved and induced by the testimony of the church to a high and reverent esteem of the Holy Scripture, and the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, the scope of the whole, which is to give glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, and the many other incomparable excellencies and the entire perfection thereof are arguments whereby it doth abundantly evidence itself to be the Word of God. So in other words, the Scriptures have these characteristics that as you look at them and read them, they should stand out and become evident to you so that Scripture becomes, as it's been said, self-authenticating. Self-authenticating a script. They ring with divinity. And they carry its characteristics into the mind and the heart. They have a self-authenticating component. And then the and then the Holy Spirit, as the Belgic Confession points out, brings that home, opens up the mind, convinces one of it. And then there's that fourth component, is they prove themselves in their, um, in their predictions. You can see that, whether those predictions are general uh, or whether those predictions are more specific. Uh, things like Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, or uh, Micah chapter 5, when it says he'll be born in the city of Bethlehem. And we can go on and on uh, where we identify, where scriptures identifies and shows themselves to be the product of the very God who controls history itself and is entering into redemption in Christ. So first, they're They're canonical. They are, the con we call them the, the canonical scriptures. Uh, and, and that's from the word canon. They are a canon. When, when we use the word canon with regard to a literary body, we're saying that, that that is the authoritative grouping of that kind of thing that functions uh, authoritative. Uh, it, you know, for example, if you're, a reader of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, you probably know that's written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and that he wrote uh, four uh, lengthy stories and then there's, there's 54 short ones, uh, short little adventures or whatever you want to call them, shorter stories. And these 54 plus the four uh, constitute what Doyle wrote on Sherlock Holmes, and they're called the canon, the Sherlock Holmes canon. That's that body of literature that's bounded as it is. Well, Scripture is a canon. It's a certain body that qualifies as distinctively Word of God evenly across the board and is grouped together into a definitive and discrete group called the Old Covenant, as we read about running from Genesis to Malachi, and then we have the canon of the New Covenant, running from Matthew to Revelation. And those, those are two canons that are connected to two covenants. One covenant from Sinai, the other covenant from Mount Zion in the New. And uh, putting those two covenant canons together, we have the total canon of our Bibles as believers in 
Jesus Christ. And it is this which is uh, the inflexible rule of our faith. If there's any debate, there's any argument about what we should, should not believe, and why, that is settled through Scripture and an appeal to Scripture. And Scripture, thus, uh, because of that, it becomes necessary. Scripture is necessary for us. Because what, it, what is Scripture? But it is God's Word, uh, God's speech, uh, revealed to us in human language so that we might know. And I, I, I reference uh, 1 Corinthians, you'll see in your outline there, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 9 through 13, on the doctrine of the necessity. We need uh, Scripture if we are indeed to have access to the mind uh, and word of God. It says, As it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. We, we, we didn't figure them out. We didn't discover them. God's revealed it through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what uh, uh, Eric is thinking uh, by looking at him. Uh, but if he opens his mouth and starts saying, well, I'm kind of wondering about what, such and such and such and such. Oh, I just found out what's in his mind. Because he spoke to me about it. Well, that's what this text is telling us. No one knows a person's thoughts except the spirit that's in within that person. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit is from God, that we might understand the things really given us by God. What a glorious thought that is. We can understand the things of God because he's given us the spirit and Paul says, and we impart this in words. <laughs> Not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Well, there we have that wonderful truth, apostolic truth, that we know the mind of God, we know the heart of God, because the Spirit of God has given to prophets and apostles that word which is communicated to us by the Spirit, and thus we can know the mind of God. And so as that text ends in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have therein the mind of Christ. And that's Scripture's necessity, you see. It's necessary for us, if we are to know God truly, if we are to know His mind and His plan and His purposes, uh, and to know His Word, we need Scripture. We can't discover the truth apart from that. We can only surmise it. And who knows whose surmising is superior to another. So Scripture is, is, is necessary for us to unequivocally know God. Otherwise, we're just left up to everyone's groping uh, and everyone's opinions. And it's Scripture as the Word of God that corrects all of our dark and carnal surmisings. And it's the Spirit of God that's given that Scripture to us that, that subdues our hearts to submit to it, subdues our hearts and our minds to say, uh, I, I'm going to listen. Uh, I'm going to make whatever adjustments my mind needs to make to be in compliance because this is God's work. And so this is how we can know Him, as the text tells us, that we might understand the things freely given to us by God, because apart from that, we can't. Apart from those scriptures, we, we're, we're lost and we're wandering around. But praise God, we have scripture, which is necessary for us, if we are to know, and if we are to be persuasive toward helping another person know. Hey, here's what the Bible says. Oh, it does. Well, I remember I used to debate a fella many years ago, 
and he happened in all of his crazy ideas about life, he happened to believe the Bible had an authoritative role. And so we'd be in a discussion. I said, well, that's not what the Bible says. I said, it says this right over here. I remember one day he reached over to me and jerked the Bible out of my hands. Let me see that. Well, what do you know? In the back. <laughs> it's necessary. It's necessary for us to have unity. It's necessary if we are to have a stable word to rally around by which we can know the truth and rejoice in it. Praise God for the necessity of Scripture and that we have it. That we might, as Paul says, understand the things freely given to us by God. And that, and that Scripture thus is consequently, it's authoritative. It's an authoritative Scripture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive to the obedience of God. Of Christ. Okay, we're able to do that. We're able to engage in this warfare of the mind. This is where the battle is. This is where it really wages. In the realm of ideas. What is and is not true. What do you believe and do not believe and why? And Paul says that weapons that we engage in, we destroy strongholds and arguments and false knowledge and bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That obedience to Christ is because we have the mind of Christ. We have the Word of Christ in which we can productively and actually and concretely Expose error. Dismantle it on the basis of the Word of God and put in its place the truth of the knowledge of God. And so Scripture functions, you see, authoritative in the mind. The mind your, your mind is either fundamentally autonomous that you will judge for yourself what is true and what you'll do. Or your mind is dependent on Christ and His Word. You've been corralled. You've been subdued. Just like the demoniac that nobody could subdue. Mark chapter 5, crazily running around, out of control. He was subdued by Christ. And so too, it's the Word of God that's authoritative. that subdues the mind into submission whereby we seek, as Paul says, to bring every thought captive to Christ, His authority, as it is exercised not just up there in the air, you know, all the headship of Christ, uh, that's good, but where does the headship of Christ up there concretely touch ground here below? It's in His Word. Productively, concretely, really. And it divides the autonomous mind from the mind of Christ being developed in us in dependence, not independence, in submission to his authority, not in preferring our own. Well, as you all well know, uh, Scripture is often used, and this is again a point of darkness, Scripture is often used as a rubber nose. Oh yeah, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. And it affirms everything I believe. Because <laughs> in one way, shape, or form, you're able to twist and turn it to submit to your own thoughts. But that brings us to the third point, is that Scripture isn't just, you know, this religious hum. <laughs> scripture isn't just this uh, a, a stream of consciousness. Uh, 
that you're, that you're able to, 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 to pull out verses to support this, that, or another uh, conception. Scripture is clear. There's a clarity to the Word of God that brings us uh, out of uh, subjectivity and every man's opinion to a point of clarity. Now, I'd like to reference 2 Peter chapter 1 for this very point, this glorious point. Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. He was there on the mount of transfiguration. For when we receive honor and glory, for when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we are with him on the holy mountain, the mountain of transfiguration, the mount of heaven come down, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you well do, will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. See what Peter is saying here, this prophetic word is like a light that shines. It doesn't just it, it doesn't leave you in a query in, 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 in just kind of an amazement stunned uh, state of, uh, uh, of being impacted by the divine. It brings light. It brings clarity. He says, you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. That's our lives. That's our hearts. <laughs> until the day dawns. From then until the day dawns. That is till Christ returns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man that men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now you have probably been assailed as a Bible-believing Christian or questioned or mocked or sneered by someone saying, well, the Bible is just written by men. So my ideas versus their ideas are the same level. Why are you just following men? Right? But, and Peter affirms that. And we should affirm, yes, the Bible was written by men. <laughs> That's right. It was spoken. <coughs> Prophecy is spoken. It is written by men. But that's not its ultimate source. Peter says, no prophecy comes from someone's own. Now, that, this particular word is the only time it occurs in the New Testament, and it's a difficult word to try to take from Greek and put it into English. And so a lot of our translators just use the word interpretation, which is not helpful. <laughs> if you were going to simplify it, you just simply say, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own source. The particular word ha uh, is used in the word of biology with regard to a spider pulling webbing out of its abdomen. Right? So, so the spider takes, where does the spider get its, uh, its webbing? Well, it pulls it out of its own abdomen, its own source, its own play. And Peter says, no prophecy of Scripture came by one's own source, own outspinning. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God. Yes, they spoke from God. Yes, they wrote, but they spoke and they wrote from God as carried along by the Holy Spirit. The source is God in the Spirit speaking through men. And the scriptures that 
are spoken, Peter identifies as light shining in our darkness. They are clear. Just not some Eastern idea of illuminating your dark cavern. It's a word from God that brings light. And, and so, in, a, in, in the most prima facie level of reading the Bible, you will discover there are certain truths there that, that are unassailable. I mean, if the Holy Spirit is working in your soul, you will be able to identify fundamental truths that are very large and big. And strict. We're sinners. Jesus Christ is the Savior who died on the cross for sinners for their forgiveness from the guilt of sin and their deliverance from the grip of sin, its power in their life. He's a Savior. The Scriptures are clear on that. We're called as, as believers in Christ, as new creation in Christ, to walk anew. We're called to, to be part of a body. Scriptures are clear. They're abundantly clear. A lot of people think, oh yeah, I can be a Christian, but I don't need to go to church. I, the scriptures are abundantly clear over and over again. This is, the very, this is the very nature of what Christ calls us to. As He calls us to Himself in worship is to be with the people. And that glory, eternal glory, lies before us. These are big, clear truths that shine into our lives that should be undebatable with regard to whether or not this is what the Word of God teaches. But praise God, not, all, not everything is all perfectly clear and shining as big, bright light. But, but, but as you go on, Peter says at the end of his epistle, keep growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not twisting the Scriptures that some do to their own destruction. So Peter starts with the clarity of Scripture in, in, in 2 Peter 1 and 2 Peter 3 as he ends uh, his epistle. He tells us uh, to keep growing in those Scriptures. To keep at it. Not like so many. And so consequently, because of these things... That this it's, scripture is a canonical, identifiable body. That scripture is uh, necessary. Scripture is clear. They are sufficient. They are sufficient, and that's exactly what Paul said in Second Timothy, uh, chapter three. That speaking to Timothy says from childhood. You've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. There it is. There's, uh, you know, that's what scriptures are there for. Make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures breathed out by God. That's the Holy Spirit breathing them out, as Peter mentioned. And profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may become complete. Complete. Sufficient, adequate, equipped for every good work. The scriptures are sufficient. Peter says God, in, in, first, in 2 Peter 1, Peter says, God has given us these precious promises uh, for all that we need for life and godliness. The scriptures give us all we need for life and godliness. 2 Peter chapter 1. That we might, what, have eternal life in Jesus Christ and be able to proceed through this world until that life is revealed at the second advent in godliness. That's all we need. This is, this is the sum total of these qualities of Scripture that end in this fact that they are sufficient. And that, that, should, that, should, that, that gets challenged. That somehow we, we need something else. We need more than. We come to church, I, you, you, you know, churches today, we come to church and you have, you have a, a whole event entertainment matrix. Isn't Scripture sufficient? 
Doesn't Scripture deliver the goods? No. We should not add to or subtract from, leave out, or think we need to fix up something having to do with Scripture. The Catholic Church wants to add the apocryphal books. When they have revelation from church councils or from the Pope speaking from the chair, cults have their independent tyrannizing gurus that proclaim themselves as being the authoritative interpreters, or uh, those who have an, an additional word, such as Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith, the, the man who started the, the Mormon church. Do you know Mormons? You're only Mormon? Nice people. Nice people make a lot of sense about a lot of things. But are they biblical? No. No. Lying behind that veneer of being nice <laughs> is a dark world of adding to the Bible as if the Bible is not sufficient and in, in, in incurring the very curse of the book of Revelation. Charismatic movement that continues to gain strength and, 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 and more and more adherence of hearing directly from God. We have self-help teachers that are disguised as preachers of the word, but in reality what they do, they just, they're pushing something else, but sprinkle a few Bible verses on. Think, therefore, okay, that's the goods. Uh, uh, you know, think positive thoughts and <coughs> expect all these things to happen in your life. Oh, and here's a few Bible verses to sprinkle on top. Oh, that somehow Christianizes whatever has been said. Not true. When I went down to Big Hat Days, I was given a little container of uh, prime rib seasoning. It says, it'll make your steak taste just like prime rib. Go ahead, put a little on your hand. So I took that seasoning, I put it on my hand, and it tasted, it tastes just like prime rib. But it wasn't prime rib. That was my hand. <laughs> There's a lot of those who sprinkle a lot of scripture around. Say, hey, this is Christian. This is Christian truth, man. This is Bible truth. No, it's not. It's just seasoning. Their actual substance is entirely different. Scriptures are sufficient. They give and deliver the goods. So let us. Brothers and sisters, affirm with the Belgic Confession this morning, with the Word of God's own testimony to it itself, that the canonical boundaries of Scripture, which brings us a Scripture that is authoritative, it's necessary, it's clear, and it is sufficient for us as a believer and as a church of Jesus Christ. As I read from Isaiah chapter 2 this morning, in the last days, what will happen? The nations will stream in to the house of God. And what will happen there? They'll hear the word of the Lord. That's the big event. They'll hear the word of the Lord. And they'll hear of Christ. And they'll hear of His atonement for their sins and the power of it in their lives. And they'll trust Him. And they'll possess life. And they'll begin to walk anew as they head to the celestial city. So brothers and sisters in Christ, right here, there's no greater soundness and sanity of mind than to have the mind of Christ in Scripture. 
That gives us, you see, the ability to navigate this world's unstable sea of insanity. Now, if you haven't seen it yet, you, you're, you're missing it. We have entered into a phase culturally of insanity universally. There's no greater comfort than to have scriptures to navigate that. There's no greater comfort than coming to scripture to have your wounds healed with the word of God. So as Martin Luther says in his great hymn, let goods and kindreds go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth found in scripture abideth still. Let us pray.